right, I think we're still at good afternoon and not good evening. So good afternoon. I know you laugh, but it works. So uh, how about that poster session? Wasn't that tremendous? Again, you'll have an opportunity uh, during the reception tonight to continue to visit the posters, but it's also a chance for the poster authors to go around and see everything else as well. Um, but terrific to see such exciting work and to see such engaged conversations. For our closing plenary, um, I have the real honor to introduce uh, Farnan Jahanian to you. Um, and we were excited that he was able to work through a particularly complicated schedule today uh, to be able to join us. Um, as you know, he is the interim president uh, currently of CMU, uh, started that position in July 2017. And previously at CMU, he was the provost and chief academic officer. Um, but also one of the reasons that he is joining us today is his past experience at NSF size uh, AD, um, where he served and led NSF's uh, size research program, um, as well as initiatives around cyber infrastructure from 2011 to 2014. Uh, so as you've seen in the discussions that we've had today, we have talked about the relationship of federal action, federal research, academic research and industry. Um, and thrilled that Farnham is able to bring so many of those perspectives uh, to our conversations today. Um, before he was at NSF, of course, he was at the University of Michigan um, in 93 to 2014, where he also served as the chair of computer science and engineering from 2007 to 2011. Um, the industry perspective comes in at least in one part from his work on internet routing stability and security, which led to the formation of Arbor Networks which was a network security company that he co-founded in 2001 and led until its acquisition in 2010. He is the author of uh, over 100 research papers, has testified uh, many times to Congress. Um, he is a graduate of University of Texas at Austin, um, and he is a fellow of AAAS, ACM, and IEEE. So we're thrilled to have you join us. Please come to the stage, Farnham. Good afternoon. Okay, now I get to wake up. I know I stand between you and reception. I get that. Uh, it's good to be with you this afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be back in Washington, D.C. among um, so many friends and collaborators and colleagues to share some thoughts with you on uh, what I refer to the accelerating digital future. And I don't think to this community uh, this is a surprise. But I want to reflect on um, some of the past and also look a little bit to the future. I think uh, we all recognize that a breathtaking uh, set of advances has brought our discipline into the forefront of science, medicine, engineering, transportation, art, entertainment in ways that we could not have even imagined it uh, 15, 20 years ago. Of course, it's transforming the way we live, the way we work, learn, uh, play, and communicate. Uh, as it's been said in the past, these advances underpin our economic prosperity and global security, serve as key drivers of competitiveness and sustainable economic growth, particularly in a, in a global environment, uh, not to mention that they uh, advance the pace of discovery and accelerate the pace of discovery in almost every field. Uh, when you talk to our colleagues who are biologists or material scientists or chemists, they tell you that their approach to scientific discovery has been transformed as a result of advances in computational approaches and data intensive approaches, without any doubt. Not to mention that, of course, these advances have been crucial. The advances have come from our community have been crucial to m achieving many of our societal priorities. This slide should not be a surprise to you. Some version of it I used to use at NSF, and I know Jim Carusi has continued to use some version of that, from environment and sustainability to healthcare and food and energy, uh, cybersecurity, transportation, uh, not to mention uh, learning and education. But what's interesting is the conventional wisdom around what we do was not quite as forward thinking, perhaps, as 
we perceive it to be today. In fact, it was believed that computers are really good at following rules or bad at pattern recognition. I think this is, was a fairly a commonly held belief. And a, a colleague at CMU who's been coded, and I'll read that, comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers and difficult impossible to give them skills of one year old when it comes to perception and mobility. In fact, it's really hard to get a computer, pick a cup, take a sip, or virtually, and put it down. In fact, low level semi-motor skills require enormous com computational resources, and most dif difficult human skills were uh, to, to reverse engineers are, are the ones that are uh, uh, unconscious. What's interesting is if you look back for the past 30, 40 years, most of the productivity gains that we have seen and broad societal impact had been because of, uh, and, and advances in information technology, uh, has been due to essentially automating repetitive or routine tasks, tasks that can be taken into smaller discrete steps and just repeat it. In fact, uh, uh, one can conjecture that in fact, much of the advances that we have seen, the impact that we've seen, has been in the, in the, in the business world in, in various forms and fashion. What's interesting is, however, over the past decade or so, certainly 10 to 15 years, and I don't want to make it sound like, oh, it just happened overnight, and 10 years ago we snapped our fingers and it happened. Far from it. As with foundational research, it's taken decades for us to get here. But if you think about what has happened and what we have seen, the advances that we have seen, and the pace of discovery from self-driving cars to complex communication to natural language understanding, face recognition, language translation, of course, Watson and Jeopardy. Uh, not to mention some of the advances we're seeing in 3D printing and, of course, amazing advances we're seeing in robotics. This is perhaps a harbinger of a more, uh, a, 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 a much more transformative uh, impact on the economy. It's no longer about automating those repetitive tasks, if you will. It's about, in fact, machines that learn um, diagnosing diseases, uh, interaction with human beings, not to mention, in fact, various ways that now computers are able to participate in creative expressions. So just consider for a moment. Uh, one could argue that the future is here. Consider what advances we have seen in, transformation, in transportation rather, and self-driving cars. I mean, many of us now drive cars that have adaptive cruise control, uh, lane departure warning systems, not to mention self-parking and so on. That's become quite actually common and we see it in many of our uh, vehicles today. And in fact, self-driving cars are quite common. In fact, if you drive around Pittsburgh today, where I live and actually a few other people in this room live, uh, it's not unusual to see, in fact, self-driving Uber cars all around town. If you look back at the DARPA autonomous vehicle grand challenges. In fact, going back only to 2014, uh, which is really not that long ago. We're talking about 13, 14 years ago. And the evolution of that and how far we've come, it's truly astonishing. I just have a question for you. In 2014, the first grand challenge, if you will, attempted to see if self-driving vehicles could cross a 240 kilometer stretch of Mojave Desert. The race ended before any of the competitors had gone more than just a few miles. Does anybody remember how many miles? Do you know the answer to this? So you can't answer, Beth. Does anybody remember? I think Howard knows the answer as well, so he's disqualified. It's not that you, I'm just wondering if you have not seen this recently, do you know what it is? Take a guess. What was it? Two. Two. It's actually not too far off. It, it went 12 kilometers, that's all. And if you actually think about that, just you know, in 2004, we're talking 12 kilometers, versus what we see around actually our cities, quite common, it's astonishing. In fact, as I mentioned, you see today's, today's Uber self-driving cars around Pittsburgh and other cities in the country. In fact, what I want to argue is that this large-scale 
competition, experimentation, and prototyping are extremely important when a technology is on the horizon. On the feasibility and the need of integration, of course, for cutting edge technologies that are gonna come together. Remember, there wasn't a single advance that we made that made all of this happen. In fact, those of you who have been involved in this work, you can say that it was an integration of LiDAR, computer vision, advances in machine learning, image processing, uh, sensing technology, onboard computing, and so on. It really is truly impressive to see the number of different technologies that have come together to do this. I know it's late in the day, so I wanted to entertain you with a video, if I could. Uh, so I go to this video, which is due to my co work of my colleague. Great. I hope you enjoyed that video. Let's try again. Uh, my colleague, Raj Rajkumar, who is in our ECE department at Carnegie Mellon. By the way, you notice that the driver does not have his hands on the wheel. I hope you notice that. And there's a big red button in the middle. You can imagine what happens when you press it. Uh, this work was done by my colleague Raj Rajkumar and of course a large group of collaborators that worked with him. That's the Cadillac CRX that was in 2011. The car is still operational. You can see it around every once in a while and so on. Uh, what was interesting is it was actually during my days at NSF, and Howard will remember this, that uh, this work, of course, was funded through the years by Department of Defense, DARPA, uh, National Science Foundation, Department of Transportation, significant uh, funding from them, and so on. So federal government as well as private sector funding. Um, I remember in, in 2013 or so, I was still at NSF, and we had brought this car uh, for a demonstration uh, to drive around essentially congressmen around uh, Washington, D.C. So I had to get approval, Raj and his collaborators had to get approval from District of Columbia, from Virginia, and so on. And I believe at that time they managed to drive around a couple of dozen congressmen in the back of this vehicle around town, which honestly that sounds like a pretty risky proposition <laughs> if you ask me. But the smart thing that they did was they would put uh, uh, one Republican and one Democrat together in a back seat, uh, just in case, so. So, where are we at? Well, when you think about it, disruption of markets and industries is not new. In fact, technological innovations have always disrupted a status quo and underpin dynamic economic change. Think of steam engines, think of electricity, printing press. But today's digital technologies and technological innovations that we're seeing are um, catalyzing uh, disruption across many markets. Adoption, adoption is happening at breathtaking path, speed, and scale. And it's also accelerating economic impact. So it's not that we haven't seen it. We just haven't seen it at this scale, at this speed, and at this level of acceleration uh, or in human history. In fact, the power of digital innovation is that it is recombining in its purest form. And in fact, I think um, uh, the economist Paul Romer said that possibilities do not merely add up, they multiply. Each development becomes a building block for future based on previous development. And progress accumulates and potentially multiplies and that's been the power of uh, what we have seen in uh, innovation and, and, and uh, digital technologies, which is really different from what we have seen in human history over the last many decades. So what I hope to do is first to highlight three of these uh, technological event advances and emerging trends and tie it to some of the national priorities. And some of these you have seen before, but a little bit more twist based on some of the advances that we have seen. The first one, of course, should not be a surprise to, any, to anyone. It's expanding limits of computation and connectivity. We've seen four decades, in fact, a number of you in this room, including Mark Hill, has been involved in this. We've seen four decades of exponential growth 
in power and with reduction in cost of computation storage and network bandwidth. Uh, it's not just Moore's law, it's exponential growth that we have seen in power and reduction of other resources as well. So that's been undeniable, and in fact, in just the past 20 years, from 1992 to 2012, this, num this data shows, the number of internet hosts and the number of transistor and microprocessors have increased by 2,000-fold, which is something I know many of you uh, recognize. In fact, I love this Gordon Moore quote that says, if there was a Moore's law for transportation, such as air travel, the mar modern commercial aircraft would cost only $500, circle the earth in 20 minutes and use only five gallons of fuel. However, it might be only the size of a shoebox, which most of us would have a hard time fitting in it. But, but also, we need to recognize that all of us now have supercomputers, of course, in our pocket. And the notion of always being on, always being connected, we kind of take it for granted. And in having this uh, almost instantaneous access to all human knowledge is something that we take for granted, but certainly the new generation uh, takes that for granted. Consider the fact that the number of mobile devices has exceeded the number of people on Earth. In fact, in 2014, it was 7 billion, and um, easily more than half of new fo phones that are sold these days are smartphones with all sorts of capabilities and sensors, including GPS and cameras and so on and so on. Uh, but this notion that we're always connected and we're always on is in fact accelerating discovery. It's in fact, uh, it, the notion of recombining that I was referring to is catalyzed by this notion of being connected. Uh, we are more connected to others than any other time in human history. I think everybody knows that and access to accumulated human knowledge is almost instantaneous. But what's interesting is because we're connected and we have social networks at work, we're also contributing to this human knowledge and we're growing during this human knowledge at an exponential level. And this is something that we're just beginning sort of to appreciate the impact of that. Of course, access to technology and information is enhancing our cognitive capabilities and life experiences. Billions of interconnected people are working together to better understand and improve the world around us. And this is all having that multiplier effect. And in fact, information technologies and human societies are now co-evolving and transforming each other in ways that we had not imagined or predicted. And that's again, is one of those things in that, that has accelerated over the last uh, decade or so. And while I add to the list of buzzwords that I shared with you, I should highlight the Internet of Things. Of course, it's not only we are connected, it's not only that the cost of computation storage and networking has gone down, but the truth is that now we're experiencing a, a, a world where we potentially could have billions of essentially small devices uh, that are connected, and I'm gonna come back to that issue uh, in, in, in just a moment. So that's one sort of advances that beyond the surface, it's, it's having far beyond the surface, it's having an impact that we could not have even imagined it over a decade or two ago. The second thing that I wanna highlight has to do again with something that a number of you in this work room have been working on, having to do with the notion of, of course, <coughs> uh, digitization of information and, and, uh, uh, and analytics. We're in a period that's called the era of information and the era of data, of course. Actually, the truth is that we are drowning in data tsunami. And of course, it's enabled by mobile phones, social media, email, video mess, uh, click streams, uh, internet transaction, not to mention, again, these potentially billions of sensors that are coming online. And in fact, the thing that's exciting a lot of people in the research community, of course, in the private sector, is being able to go from data to knowledge to be able to act on it, and the widespread of use of data to create actionable information that could have potential uh, uh, a, a societal ramifications. Of course, there's also broad recognition that we're generating more data than we're able to consume it. But when we go beyond this notion of extracting knowledge from data, so we have seen well-documented, essentially, research on 
uh, that shows, in fact, we're able to classify breast cancer via image analysis, energy savings in homes and buildings, reducing tra traffic con congestions in uh, urban areas, and so on. So again, people who've been in the database community have worked on data analytics and so on. This is not a surprise to them. But again, the advances that we've seen through investment in basic research over the last uh, four decades plus now has brought us to a point now we're looking at constructing computer systems that automatically learn, and I know you've talked about some of this earlier this morning, and improve through experience. Again, that's a paradigm shift. It's no longer about being able to do the routine task, or in fact being able to extract knowledge from vast amount of information. It's about learning essentially, and adapting, and learning through experiences. And that brings to reality the notion of ev evidence-based decision-making and policy formulation in a broad range of areas, from healthcare to education to public safety to urban services and marketing and so on. We can't underestimate the importance of that because I think all of you would agree that in fact we have had decades of policies that are not necessarily backed by data. Now we're looking at an environment, in fact, that decision making and policy making could be informed by access through data and also through some of the advances that we see. Just to give you an example of that, just a few examples of things that, that we're going to see. Of course, just a few years ago, we experienced Watson and IBM, and that's growing, of course, learning to extract information from text and answer, question answering. But consider the fact that now we have systems that learn to detect object images. We have systems that classify what uh, a person is thinking about based on fMRI and brain activity. Not to mention we have learning systems that learn prostatic control from neural implants. These are all applications of these learning systems that we're beginning to see come to fruition. I want to pivot, and I'm not going to be able to talk about all data, different applications of societal impacts, but I want to highlight one of them uh, uh, having to do with uh, health and well-being. In fact, information and communication technologies are poised to transform access and participation in our own health and well-being. In fact, there have been a number of now programs that have come from various funding agencies focusing on this. The reality is that we're moving from episodic, reactive focus on disease to much more proactive and preventive evidence-based focus on well-being and quality of life. We're at the point that we can really talk about preventing onset of diseases improving diagnosis and treatment through access essentially to analytics and machine learning techniques, not to mention enhance the quality of healthcare and personalization of healthcare, not, and, and furthermore empowering us to participate in our own healthcare and well-being. These are all transformative. A couple of examples of that. Consider, for example, analysis, analysis of social media and search to track flu epidemics and potential spread of infectious diseases in uh, conceivably in real time. Consider identifying new brain areas and uh, specific types of synaptic changes that occur during learning uh, and also disease states or uh, treatment conditions. Another example is being able to make better diagnosis decisions, diagnostic decisions rather, by detecting subtle changes in premature baby conditions, <coughs> excuse me, that may signal the onset of infections 24 hours before uh, actually symptom, symptoms show up, and learning prosthetic control from neural implants is another one that I've mentioned. These are truly transformative and are happening as a result of advances that we're seeing. The last one that I want to highlight has to do with automation, and smart systems. Now, I could have given this many different labels. For those of you who are doing research in robotics, apologies ahead of time. It'll show up later. The word robotics, of course, has to enter in this context as well. There are a couple of forces at play. One has to do with the melding of the cyber and the physical world that's enabling all sorts of smart systems around us. This has to do with deep integration of physical world and that goes beyond computers, beyond smartphones, and involves potentially uh, an unbounded number of sensors. We're talking about cyber physical systems that aim to deeply integrate computing, communication, and control 
into the physical environment. So we're surrounded now with smart everything. Buildings, infrastructure, transportation, cities, healthcare, of course, delivery, energy, environment, and so on. But what's fascinating is if you think of these cyber physical systems, and now you think about all the advances that we're making in learning systems, if we could put all of this together. Now you have systems that not only adapt, they learn and they respond. And that again adds another level of complexity, but more importantly, will lead to certain kind of uh, uh, societal impact that we probably have not seen. Of course, these systems have to have dependable operations with high assurance of reliability, safety, security, and usability. I'll say a couple of words about this, but the focus of this presentation is not on all the uh, um, dependability operations of these systems. <coughs> Excuse me. So, not a surprise that we have seen now a bounded, unbounded list of essentially um, smart systems and new applications. You just have to slap the word smart in front of anything and you'll come up with it. And I tried to do that um, on this slide, as you can see. It took only five minutes. But let me talk about totally a different kind of application. Let me talk about the use of smart systems and their implications for these smart and connected cities to illustrate a couple of points. Let me digress for a couple of minutes just to give, set the context for this. We live in a world, we're seeing a confluence of essentially <coughs> urbanization and digital ubiquity. We're actually in the midst of a transformation. The intersection between urbanization and ubiquitous digital technology will shape our world for decades to come. People are living longer, having fewer children, and the, these trends and forces are acting in concert to amplify and produce changes at a rapid pace. So, there are two forces at play, age of urbanization, and also the changes in demogra demographics. Not to mention all the acceleration that I talked about in scope, scale, and ubiquity, and the economic impact, of course, is underlying all of this. Let me share some data with you about the age of urbanization. In 2008, for the first time in human history, more people lived in cities than in rural areas. By 2050, in fact, nearly two-thirds of the world is projected. 9.7 billion population will live in urban areas. Over the last decade, the global urban population has been rising by an average of 65 million people. Just imagine that. 65 million people more in urban areas every year. In China alone, 300 million people are expected to move to urban areas over the next 15 years. India needs to build the equivalent of a new Chicago every year to keep up with that demand. These are just staggering numbers if you think about it. And half of the global GPD growth between 2010 and 2025 is expected to happen in about 400 cities in emerging markets. 50% of the population involves cities, this urbanization rather, involves cities that have less than 500,000 people in population. Cities that you would not even be able to name across the world. And of course, cities as studies have shown, display greater ne network effect and growth of innovation, district, mixed use, and all of that, that, that architects and city planners that talk about are, are all coming to fruition. So that's the age of urbanization. Just imagine the complexity of the world that we're doing, dealing with. And potential role of technology in moderating that growth or at least helping with that growth. But the for a fact is that the world is also getting older. 65 is rapidly 65 plus is rapidly increasing in both advanced and emerging countries. There's a lot of data to back that up. The ratio of uh, 65 plus um, to children was less than 15, uh, to children less than 15 uh, will go from 3 to 10 to 16 to 10 between 1950 and 2050 in just 100 years. And there's other data to, to support that. But the impact on the future of workforce is undeniable. Now step back for a moment and think about the role of technology and all the discussions that are taking place in the world about potential automation, robotics, and so on, and future work, and how that is going to interplay with the world that's getting more urbanized and at the same time also it's becoming more gray. Which leads us to 
some great opportunities and no, no doubt some amazing challenges as well. So when we talk about smart cities, uh, people in our community and people in broader community, city designers, um, uh, policy makers and so on, are thinking about, and architects are thinking about, emergence of essentially uh, looking at, at cities as, as potentially living laboratories. It's beyond really the scope of this discussion, but there's so many examples that show that suddenly the kind of technologies that we're talking about will potentially lead to enhanced quality and delivery of urban services in large communities. It would potentially increase resiliency and efficiency of city infrastructure. Imagine if you're building a brand new city from scratch, how would you design that city and how would you instrument that city versus the cities that are old, there have aging infrastructure that we still have to deal with, such as Pittsburgh or <coughs> Chicago and so on. Um, there is potential opportunity, and this is not a slam dunk, potential opportunity through access to technology for increased access and inclusion, more sustainable environments with smarter uh, uh, growth path. In fact, <clears throat> bottom line is, can technology be used to create cities that deploy emerging essentially these advances that we're seeing to provide better quality of life for citizens? That's really bottom line. It's really better quality of life uh, for citizens. And of course, flattening these urban peaks by data-driven decision making and having most importantly, citizen Im citizens involved and engaged in shaping their communities which in some ways could be very transformative. And there are many examples of that. Again, I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna skip over a couple of examples that I was gonna show you. But a very simple one of it, for example, that, that my colleagues at, at CMU and, and in Pittsburgh, they played with, is use of cell phones and city buses, which is essentially being used as a very simple sensor. This is trivial almost, but there's analytics behind it that essentially allows us to essentially to monitor the city road condition potholes, you can expand that to be, of course, the traffic and other things and so on, to prioritize repair as well as guide preventive maintenance. It's a very, very simple, uh, almost uh, trivial examples of that. And uh, just imagine that many cities now are talking about having light bulbs that essentially in cities that are instrumented, they're sensors, and not only they can measure air quality, but they can actually have cameras on them. I realize there are privacy issues and so on that have to be addressed. So going beyond smart cities, I, I should acknowledge that in fact, one of the most important uh, emerging frontiers has to do with robotics and, and automation. We're seeing as a result of in fact, the work that's done by uh, our community, increasingly capable robots with enhanced senses, dexterity, intelligence, used to automate tasks, augmenting human capabilities and working besides and cooperatively uh, with people. In fact, I'm reminded of the National Robotic Initiatives and of course the uh, NRI's focus was on co-robots, robots that work cooperatively with people. In fact, since Howard Wackler is here, I should acknowledge all the great work that he did in fact in launching of the National Robotics Initiative at the time in the previous administration. Of course, we talked about autonomous vehicles, but more importantly, we're now beginning to see applications that go beyond the obvious industrial automation to uh, services, personal safety, surgery, response, uh, emergency response, even human augmentation, which uh, could be quite interesting. But these applications are not too far off. In fact, many of them, we are seeing that in prototype form or more advanced form. So beyond these three broad advances that I talked about, uh, what I want to talk about, of course, I'll leave you with three points related to some of the challenges uh, that we face. So the three advances, of course, had to do with <coughs> exponential growth that we've seen in computation, storage, and connectivity with access to data and learning systems, and finally, automation and, and robotics and smart systems. But I want to leave you with, in the next 10 minutes or so, with uh, three broad points. One point in terms of challenges we face. Technology alone will not solve of all of society's challenges. As computer scientists and technologists, we need to acknowledge this more often. In fact, 
we often believe that systems that we build will solve all of the world's problems, but we all know this, that you have to consider economic, social, cultural, ethical barriers to adoption of solutions and impact of technology on society. In fact, one of the challenges we're gonna face, in fact, many of you in this room who are academics, think about the freshman college students that we admit to our universities. They're gonna be in the workforce for the next 30, 40 years. In fact, they may be in the workforce longer. Think about what we teach them. Think about the impact of advances that we see, not only in terms of enhancing learning outcomes, which I think is extremely important and continues to be very, very exciting uh, for the education community. But think about the impact of automation and technology on the future of workforce and all the debate that is going to start related to that. And the special role that I think our community has to play in that arena and contribute to the conversation. And it's not as simple as, oh, all the jobs are gonna be are gonna go away and we're gonna be replaced by robots. And it's not gonna be also that we're all gonna get to sit at home on our couches and watch, I'm not sure what, uh, and the robots are gonna do all of our works and we're gonna be happy. So neither of these two worlds are actually realistic. But the impact on the future of work is undeniable. And also recognition that the technology has to be done in the context of social, cultural, and ethical context that exists. One of those that I wanna spend a couple of minutes on has to do with cybersecurity and the challenges that loom, in fact, larger as technology pervades every sector of our economy. So, I want to just summarize my thoughts on cybersecurity in, a, in two or three slides. One of the things that I want to just emphasize is that we don't do the easy stuff well, and the hard stuff is just getting harder. In fact, if you want to look at the future of security challenges. And if you go back to talks that I've given on this topic 10, 15 years ago, it's the same sentence as it turns out, I haven't actually changed my tune. The slides just look a little prettier. Uh, future cybersecurity challenges will follow technology and internet adoption patterns. If you believe in that, and if you believe in the acceleration and the scale and the scope of advances we see in technology, it shouldn't be surprised that Advances we see in wireless, the advances that we see in <coughs> proliferation of mobile devices, advances that we see in social media, and advances that we see in learning systems now are going to create new vectors of attack, new cybersecurity challenges. That is an almost, this is an obvious statement, but what's not probably, and I'm not going to show you the data that's behind this, is that we actually fail miserably at doing the really easy stuff. So, when we talk about big data and security, I think we all recognize that big data is also a big security target. Apple has access to hundreds of millions of customer credit cards. Facebook has almost two billion users, probably larger by now. It's no longer also about protecting internal data. It's the impact of platform and ecosystems. It's about all the partners that work with these companies and so on. In fact, there are more than two million apps in the App Store as of actually a year ago, and that number is growing. But if we believe that the machine learning and the learning systems are going to be the way of the future, the need for research on adversarial machines <coughs> learning problems are going to be greater. By the way, when I said we don't do the easy stuff well, look at that slide. Look at Target, look at Equifax, look at Home Depot, Look at the attack on NASDAQ. Look at the attack on, of course, the Office of Personnel Management. Almost every one of these were attacks that happened because of lack of good hygiene. In fact, Equifax being the most recent example of that. So that's what I mean when I say we don't do the easy stuff well. But going to a harder stuff, when we look at machine learning and learning systems, of course, the need for research for adversarial machine learning problems, the data <coughs> excuse me, or analysis may be manipulated directly or indirectly, and the impact of fake news on, on society, of course, is undeniable. We all know about this. And in fact, we need to recognize an adversary can game the system to make, to evade detections or uh, create false alarms. In fact, can machine learning techniques can be applied to cybersecurity problems? The answer is yes. 
It's not going to be a silver, silver bullet, but may help to provide the context for better um, decision making and some of the solutions that we see. Of course, the privacy issues are also loom larger. Amazon is mon monitoring our shopping preferences. Google is tracking our browsing habits. Facebook captures our social interactions and more. Twitter tracks our real-time thoughts. Maybe it's predicting our real-time thoughts. Wireless, that would be interesting. Uh, wireless service operators track our connections and who is nearby and policies for data ownership, govern governance and stewardship and sharing, of course, are becoming extremely important. There's no question that we've seen a surge in gathering, storing, and analyzing and monitoring our personal data. And of course, the notion of informed consent, opting out and anonymization are not as effective uh, to ensure privacy with big data. I mean, the simple question is, how can, you, how can companies provide notice for a purpose that has not been invented? And if the past decade or so is, is any indication, there are many things we're gonna do with these technologies and access to data that we have not thought about yet. So the notion of opting out is also not a, a compelling reason. By the way, I'm not giving you any solutions, just highlighting problems. As I said, future security challenges will continue to follow technology trends and internet adoption patterns. I talked about learning systems, but also just talk about cybersecurity of cyber physical systems, which has been well documented by the security community. As we're leaping from digital into the physical realm, in fact, from automotive systems to smart grids to embedded medical devices, uh, some of you do research in this, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, industrial controls. We see all of this, and, uh, and uh, I was referring to Kevin Fu, by the way. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we've seen documented examples of uh, uh, security issues having to do with uh, cyber physical systems. And of course, when we talk about the Internet of Things, we're really talking about Internet of Unsafe Things. As we've seen this digital makeover of physical things, imagine, the estimates are that there are 6.5 billion devices growing to 21 billion devices by 2020, according to Gartner. Every one of these analysts has a different analysis. But we're seeing proliferation of devices that are designed to control, to be controlled over the network. And we're seeing significant, of course, expansion of attack surface to exploitable uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Um, the consumer expectation cannot be that they're going to patch their thermostat or rice cooker. It's just not going to happen. If we don't patch our mobile devices and we don't patch our laptops uh, and desktops, there's no way that we're going to patch, even if it was possible, those devices. And in fact, what worries me the most is if we believe that we have a software crisis in the world, just imagine the market pressure on companies with limited secure software experience, software development experience, that are out there developing software for all sorts of devices that are being released. And in fact, the memory and power issues make this complicated, but I think just good software engineering practices, we shouldn't expect that it's gonna happen on its own. By the way, for those of us who teach computer science, that's again another problem. And of course, lack of common standards and interfaces. I'm running out of time, so I was gonna share with you the Mirai attack that happened um, uh, just a, a year or two ago, uh, which was a essentially attack because of uh, lack of password control and lack of password on some of these devices uh, that happened by compromising essentially security cameras, video recorders, baby monitors, and so on. Launched massive denial service attacks. In fact, one of these on October 21st on the Dyn DNS provider. This was a cyber attack that brought down much of America's internet uh, during that week of October 21st for a good day or so, uh, because this is a company that controls essentially uh, a large fraction of internet's domain name server system. And the result was that in fact, um, Twitter, The Guardian, Netflix, Reddit, CNN, and many, many others were actually brought down as a result of that attack. And the simple thing is that, in fact, most of these devices did not have password or had passwords like one, two, three, four. And guess what happened? Um, the last point I want to make related to cybersecurity before I wrap up uh, with two quick other quick points um, has to do with weaponization of information. I think this is becoming an extremely an important uh, issue for, for um, society. 
we're actually seeing Cold War tactics uh, that were deployed years ago now in the cyber world. Here's the bottom line. The most cherished attributes of the internet, the speed, reach, openness, the notion of anonymity are being used to undermine essentially Western liberal values and democracy. The pervasive essentially narrative of the tech world, the world that we live in, is that web and social media democratize information seeking, and I'm just gonna read that, and empower ordinary people. That's absolutely true, up to a point. It's actually made it easier to distribute propaganda, misinformation, and fake news on internet. And now we're beginning to see the result of that. In fact, cyber has become a new domain for warfare, beyond essentially attacks on um, financial systems and beyond attacks on, on military systems. So you see blended attacks on confidentiality of information, availability of information, and integrity of, in fact, cyber-enabled systems. This is by far probably one of the most significant threats uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to democracy in, in the coming um, decade. Um, with that editorial, let me go to my point number two, which is this again to this community, to our community is not a surprise. Universities continue to play a growing and central role in the innovation ecosystem, driving essentially economic growth. As I look across this room, many of you in various universities in, in cities that you have contributed in fact the economic growth of those cities and, and in fact through startups or through essentially licensing technologies that companies have gotten. What we're seeing is that the ability to relate our research outcome to these transformative econ economic development will continue to be a fundamental driver that's gonna shape our uh, research investments. It doesn't mean that everybody gets involved in technology transfer, far from it. However, technology transfer from universities is becoming an important part of what we see in academic institutions. By the way, Technology transfer also, we should recognize it doesn't happen overnight. You have decades of basic research, fundamental research that happens that leads finally to some commercial impact or societal impact. So we should never forget that all of this is possible because we invest in basic research and funda fundamental research. So transfer of technology from universities is not about protection of intellectual property. In fact, most universities now get this. Uh, that are created in our research laboratory. It's about knowledge dissemination, it's about economic development. More importantly for most of our faculty colleagues and researchers, it's about societal benefits. It's about making our universities play that important role in the innovation ecosystem and economic growth. With that, I wanna move to my last point and of, uh, the, the third point rather, and the last point. We also recognize that if you believed uh, uh, some of the conjecture and, and, and the potential, essentially, I should say, transformative impact of the technologies that, that we're seeing, we're in a period of rapid and profound social, economic, technological transformation, of course, uh, um, accentuated by extraordinary global competition, un mm -hmm. undeniable. Uh, I believe, however, in this country, our R&D investments do not match our global economic aspirations, nor our national security rhetoric. In fact, if you step back, and I have said this in other venues, um, the rest of the world has figured out that in fact, investment in research and education is ticket to prosperity. And that's something that actually this country has exercised for the past 50, 60, 70 years. In fact, since World War II, no doubt. In fact, it's undeniable the investment that we've made in research and in education in this country has been one of the main reasons for the economic prosperity and national security that we've enjoyed over the so many decades. If you look at this, and this is 2013, there's some more recent data, that the rest of the world is catching up and the rest of the world has figured out that in fact, their ticket to prosperity is investment in education. And while US continues to be the largest R&D investor uh, at a very global, at a, at a very competitive level. Uh, the truth is, of course, the rest of the world is catching up and investment in other countries is growing uh, significantly. And this is, of course, accentuated by the shifting demographic that we see domestically and globally. To highlight this, 
Let me just skip over this to highlight this. This is a data that I know that Peter Harsha also has shared with you. This, I think, comes from uh, AAAS. If you look at federal investment in the budget and our economy, as a percentage of, as a share, uh, essentially uh, R&D investment, as a share of federal budget, or as a share of our percentage of our GDP, it has actually been declining since the 1960s. This is a very, very alarming, actually, data. And it's undeniable, it's right there, right in front of you. In fact, even with some of the increases that we have made, the truth is that we're not keeping up, in fact, even with inflation. So that is one of the biggest concerns, which really brings point, the point that the basic research community, a thriving basic research community, is a foundation for long-term discovery and innovation. It's a foundation for our economic prosperity, and it's a foundation for our national security. So if there's a lesson to be learned from all of the investment that we've made is that it is undeniable that the investments over the last five, six decades in research and education not only has led to all the advances we've seen in science and engineering and technology, but it also has had broad societal impact and has been one of the main reasons for our economic prosperity. I want to leave you with a quote from Vannevar Bush, who, as I'm sure most of you know, was the first science advisor to a U.S. president uh, in, uh, right after World War II. Uh, the, his vision of endless frontier uh, was the vision that ensured science became a national priority after World War II, led to the formation of National Science Foundation and significant commitment to long-term high-risk research by government and the private sector. In fact, it led to scientific advances and engineering innovations that we have enjoyed over the last many decades. Vannevar Bush's vision of the endless frontier, and I'm just going to quote it, basic research is the pacemaker of technological progress. And new products and new processes do not appear full grown. They are founded on new principles and new conceptions, which in turn are painstakingly developed by research in the purest realm of science. Thank you very much. So Beth, I don't know if I signed up for questions, but there's a couple of minutes. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Please. I mean, mostly you're preaching to the choir here. Who is the audience you really want this uh, talk to go to? Do you know, that, that's a great question. I, I hope I'm preaching to the choir. If I had to convince you, Lance, I would be in a lot of trouble. You know, I, I think it's the broader, first of all, acknowledging, uh, while I, I, I do agree with you that this is preaching to the choir, uh, there are a couple of points that we need to acknowledge. The impact of the advances that we're seeing, we're probably even underestimating. it. And I think every couple of years we see that, in fact, we've been underestimating the advances and potential societal impact. So that's something I think the community has to embrace. But the recognition that these advances are going to have transformative impact on the future of work is undeniable. And this is something that I think our community not only needs to embrace it, but has to participate in the conversation with people outside our community, because that is going to be increasingly an important point. Um, finally, uh, the notion that all the advances that we're making has to be understood in the context of social, ethical, and policy ramifications that have is again something that as scientists and engineers were excited about developing them, adva adva making advances, foundational advances, but the broader societal impact has some cost associated with it that has to be recognized. So who should be the real audience? In fact, that is our responsibility. The audience is the broader society and potentially our policymakers people in the administration, in Congress, and all the good work that all of you are trying to, trying to do to make everyone outside our community, outside actually the education community, uh, to, to um, appreciate that. Thanks, Farnham. Yeah. I, I loved your broad interpretation and description of all the, the wonderful things that are happening, and it was all great until the last slide. Uh, just the Vannevar Bush uh, citation is, 
increasingly seen as problematic now, yeah. and that his advocacy see of the linear model of research that unfettered basic research be conducted in the university without connection sure. to the real world has again and again been demonstrated to be flawed and that the uh, growing consensus and the evidence is very clear that really what works is the partnership between academic researchers working on real problems with partners outside the campus yeah. not the kind of work that he advocated. He was wrong, and again and again, I, we're still stuck with that model. I, I'm actually not sure, with all the respect, all but right. I would agree with your <laughs> assessment of that. I, I think trying to characterize this, and to be, to be candid, uh, when I was at NSF, I was faced with the same issue over and over, where people were on one side talking about foundational research versus applied research, or curiosity-driven research versus research that has applications. I think those characterizations are just wrong. It's flatly wrong, okay. and I know you agree with this. We need to look at this, and I think the Vannevar Bush's quote, the reason it still has value is it argues that we need to make investment in research and make the investment in research and support people who do foundational work, things that we may not in fact understand the implication of it for decades to come, to people who are working on research problems that may have actually more direct impact. Now, no one denies, however, that what we do today versus, say, 40 or 50 years ago, the world has become much more interdisciplinary. There's also a broad recognition that many of the challenges that we face as society, as humanity, cannot be addressed purely through advances in narrow disciplinary boundaries. Now, I'm not arguing that every scientist and every researcher should abandon their deep disciplinary exploration in sort of uh, uh, in exchange for interdisciplinary research. But there is growing evidence that in fact many of our societal problems and problems that face humanity are going to require people from different perspectives and disciplines right. to come together. And we I don't have that to choose is the most anymore. We don't that? have to do one or the other. You should, That's I mean, exactly projects which do both, the evidence is very powerful that it's a winning strategy in citation counts, impact, and so I think that's a great, I can agree with that. Thanks for your talk. I did see that was city-centric, and I wonder what is your view? What's, what centric, I'm sorry? Was city-centric or urban-centric? in the sense that the urbans and the, we live in an urban age as has been called recently. Sure. But what are your thoughts about their future since probably most of the resources that will be needed in order to sustain that, tre sure. that tremendous growth might be located in those places like the rural areas that are basically experiences, experiencing one of the major migrations to the urban Places and that, my question would like the I would like you ask you to reflect on sure. the science, the technology, and the <coughs> innovation, and how we can keep up or enhancing <coughs> those in these rural areas. Thank you for that question. My uh, purpose of showing essentially cities as living laboratories was not to suggest that would be the only thing. I, I completely agree with you that in fact while we see this mass sort of migration to cities and urban areas, it's gonna create a lot of challenges. In fact, many of the resources that are going to be, that are scarce and are going to become more scarce is going to be exacerbated, the, the shortage, as a result of max exodus to, 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 to cities. So part of the point was to say that those advances in technology has a potential, have the potential to address some of the challenges we face in the cities. But I don't at all disagree or dispute that in fact, they're equally applicable, applicable to dealing with uh, um, sustainable resources, to also dealing with some of the issues that uh, uh, the rural areas face. And in fact, if you think about agriculture and so on, uh, there's no question there's some advances that we can make that helps food production, food delivery, energy production, energy delivery, all of these things that are in fact are gonna be helped, whether we think of it in context of rural, or rural or environment or, or the cities. I think with that, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.